Thank you for joining us for a message from Vision Church. We hope that you can experience God in a real and powerful way today. Our teaching team has crafted a message that will be able to impact you no matter what stage of life you're in. So grab your Bible and something to write with and let's dive into God's Word together. So uh, who in here has, uh, has watched any of The Chosen? The Chosen? And I tell you, I started watching it a couple years ago and got away from it, and now I'm in a season where God put in my heart to start watching it, and actually in a very interesting place. Actually, I'm, I'm watching it at Planet Fitness. I think I'm probably the only person watching The Chosen at Planet Fitness. You're like, oh, that's the pastor. Now, this isn't, this isn't the pastor. When I'm at the gym, I'm, I'm Matt, the workout machine, right, Jacoby? Right? Okay, so, but, but all seriousness, so, uh, so what God's put in my heart lately is when I'm doing cardio at the gym... I'm watching The Chosen. I'm listening to my earbuds. And yesterday, the, the episode I was watching, Mary Magdalene was in it. And I know we, we, we read about people in the Bible, but there's something when you see visuals about people. And I understand there's, there's creative liberty. You, you have to give that to The Chosen or The Passion of the Christ or the Bible series. But if you will work within that creative liberty, when I was standing here right now and I sang that word redeemed, it reminded me of what I saw yesterday when Mary Magdalene, she had been possessed by demons, and Nicodemus came to visit her, and Nicodemus was one of the experts in the, in the Jewish law of those days, and he came in to, to where she was, and he couldn't do a thing about the demons. In fact, he was scared to death and got out of there. Well, a couple of days later, he heard that she was acting totally differently, and he went to talk with her, and she was a brand new person. He said, what, what happened to you? And she said, I met a man. I didn't even know the man's name. But the man spoke into me like no person ever had before. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he redeemed me. Yes. Amen. Ooh, and I just sang that word because what, what Nicodemus said to her in that moment was, so are you going to remember this man? And, and she looked back at him. She said, look, I was one way. And the rest of my life, I'm going to be a different way because of that man. You bet I will always remember that man. And so I want to encourage you again. When, when you sing songs and you pull out words like redeemed, or we're singing about dominions and powers, and in that I'm thinking, man, you've seen in the chosen the Romans. You're seeing the soldiers. You're hearing about the emperor. Jesus is above those powers and dominions. You understand that? Jesus is above that. And when we see that in our head and sing it in our heart, our worship truly flows in a way that just connects you with God and with heaven. So you'll be seated. I just need to share that with you because our team comes in here and they are led by God to take us into God's presence. And before I even preach today, because I'm not preaching yet, so kids, don't, eat, don't leave yet. Just hang on the back. But um, I want to tell you some things God's doing here at our church and something new we're going to start today. And then I'll preach to you because I've got something great to tell you today about an amazing gift that God has for us. But let me tell you about some things that, uh, that God's been doing in our church. Monday night, we went to Gastonia Street Ministry. Who was out there Monday night? We some hands who was out there. Y'all, it was amazing. We go off this campus. We take seed money from our church. Literally, when you give to our church, we take 10% and send it back out as seeds. We take money and go out and buy food and buy supplies, take it out in the community in different places. We went to Gastonia Street Ministry. You can see smiles, love, music, testimony, somebody got saved on Monday night, and li listen to this, it wasn't the pastor who did it, it was one of our ministers right here, Fawn. You're like, oh, she's on staff? No, every person at Vision Church that calls Jesus your savior, you're a minister. Amen. And Monday night, Fawn and Care and Michael, they ministered to this man, and, and the way Fawn described it was that there were tears on the floor after they talked with him and he accepted Christ. So praise God for that. That's Gastonia Street Ministry. That's what God does. Um, if you want to be a part of a, yeah, we got a hand up right there. You praise the God for GSM, aren't you? Everything was, great. Everything was great. Absolutely. Thank you for coming today. Yes. So, so at our church, if you want to be a part of, of giving to this ministry, you can do it in person in the brown box. You can text it to 84321. You can mail it in. Most people give online, and that way we just steward it. Our finance team takes care of it. We take seeds and give it away. We use the rest as best we can to tell people about Jesus Christ because we want people redeemed. We want lives changed. We want people to go from one life 
to something different for the rest of their life and for eternity. That's what happens when you give here, so I encourage you to do that. Now, another um, local partner we have is Bit of Hope Ranch. As you know, it's dear to my heart because my wife Meg runs it, but we don't partner with them because of Meg. We partner with them, number one, because they bless us, and we get to go out there and have men's fishing events and volunteer events and worship nights, and we had Easter service out there in 2020 when they said, churches you can't meet, we said, my God is above powers and dominions, so you know what, we're meeting on Easter 2020, we did it outdoors, we spread out, but out at Bit of Hope Ranch, they bless us, we love to bless them back, so in fact, this next Saturday, they're having Stories of Hope tour, and I get to be a little piece of that, I get to tell you one of the miracle stories about what God has done at Bit of Hope Ranch, and what God's doing consistently out there is he's, he's blessing people mentally, emotionally, physically. He's taking care of people. He's using uh, trained staff and animals to minister to people at Bit of Hope Ranch. So if you want to go out there next Saturday 11 for the tour, or if you want to help out, our church actually is hosting and blessing them with food that day. You can stop by Next Steps today and say, hey, I'm going to help with the tour next week. Sign up for that. So, uh, and then the last thing that I want to announce to you is uh, pray in May. Somebody say Pray. In May. in May. These guys knew we were praying in May because actually what we did is we said, if you want to be in on this, you just take your connection card, write your name down, put pray in May, turn it in the brown box or next steps, and one day during the month, your household will be prayed for by our church. And on the first, it was beautiful Nelson and Sulena Benegas, their family, their household. We prayed for them. If you want to be a part of being prayed for and praying in May, write that down your connection card. It's in the back of your chairs. Turn it in. Throughout the month, like it said in Acts chapter 1, we are joining together constantly in prayer. We can't do it 24-7, but I tell you, we can do it day by day, and join us in that, please. That's what we're doing. Pray in May. Now, um, we got something new we're starting today, because part of my role, my calling, honestly, my passion is to teach. Like, I want people to learn and not just stay where they're at in life. That was definitely part of my, my previous career. When I was in sports medicine and then I was in recreation, I used those avenues to teach people, help move forward in life, and now God has me as a pastor. So as a lead pastor of Vision Church, we're going to try something different. In fact, we're going to call it Teach Me Something. So let me probably say Everybody say, teach me something. Teach me something. Now, I, I need a little, bit of, a little bit of flavor too, so say it, teach me something, pastor. Teach me something, pastor. Okay, there we go. I like that. I like that a little better. So, <clears throat> so each week... Normally in the spot before the message, but it might move around a little bit. Either me or somebody from our team is going to teach you something. So certainly you're, you're going to get the sermon. I promise you. And today's sermon, whoo, y'all, it is good stuff out of Acts 2. But before we go there, I'm going to introduce this concept of, of teach me something. Because when you think about the Christian life, I want you to be constantly learning and constantly growing. Healthy things grow. So if you are walking with Jesus, you should be growing. So I want you to come in with an expectation on Sundays that, yes, you're going to get the sermon, Bible-based, spirit-filled. We're going to bless you through that, and we're also going to teach you something. Sometimes it'll be a light topic. Sometimes it'll be something heavier. Uh, sometimes we'll put a card out and say, hey, give us some of your ideas. We'll take that. We'll teach you on that. So that you truly, if you're eager to learn, you're going to learn. So the way ideally we'll do it is we'll start off. We'll say, hey, it's time for teach me something. We'll say, are you ready? And you'll say, teach me something. So let's try it. Are you ready? Teach me something. Okay, you got it. All right, here we go. Now, you may hear from time to time our mission here at Vision is two parts. It's to lead people to Christ, and it's to help them live out God's vision for their life. So the first part of that clearly is salvation, and I also personally believe that at times we drift. We don't lose our salvation, but we drift, and you need somebody to kind of lead you back to Christ. I'm not talking about that part today. The second half, though, about helping you live out God's vision for your life. Oh, kids. Alana, you should have weighed me down. Kids, elementary kids, jump on up, spin around three times, and head that way with Alana. They're going to have an amazing time in Trailblazer. Adults, you can do it too if you want, but um, spin around. Don't go. Stay here. So we talk about this, this, this concept that God has a vision for your life. And I love that because this, you know, this word vision, um, that really is like a, it's like a picture, maybe it's something hasn't happened yet, or a picture of what could be, kind of like fueled by a conviction that it should be. So here is the, uh, the teach me something for today. What does it mean that God has a vision for your life? 
You may hear the mission statement like, oh, that's nice. Oh, that's really good. Man, my church, they, they want to help people. Well, what does that mean, though, that God has a vision for your life? Well, first, I want to give you a couple verses on this. Psalm 139, 16. It says, your eyes, talking about God, your eyes saw my unformed body. All the days ordained for me were written in your book before one of them came to be. So you understand, God knows how many days you have on this planet. If we're living to be 80, that's what, you know, 30,000 days, let's just say. So he knows what number today is of your, of your numbers. He knows that. Even in Psalm 90, 12, it says, teach us to number our days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. So don't you ever wake up and think today's a throwaway day. It's not a throwaway day. God's word is telling you to number today. It might not be the best day of your life, but it's a day. Oh, and in fact, Melissa's in here somewhere. She said it beautifully this morning about uh, going to wake up and see another sunrise. It's a brand new day. How you describe that? Moved our team in VIP. It was like, yes, every day has new possibilities. You can number a day and literally say, God, I'm not sure how many I got left, but today I'm going to make the most of today. In Psalm, in uh, Jeremiah 29, 11, you may hear it a lot, but don't miss the meaning in this where it says, I know the plans I have for you, declares God, plans to prosper you, not to harm you, plans to give you hope in the future. What I see in that is that you're not walking some random path. It may feel like it sometimes, or it may feel like a bad path sometimes. Trust me, God has plans for you. He has plans for you. And the last verse I want you to think about, Proverbs 3, 5, and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Don't lean on your own understanding. In your ways, acknowledge him, and he will direct those paths. So don't miss this. When you're thinking about the fact that God has a vision for your life, he, he knows how many days you're going to have. He wants you to make sure everyone matters. He wants you to, to trust the, his plans. He wants you to follow his plans. So we have to get to a spot where we believe that it, it's not about my vision. It's, it's not about my, my, my wife's vision, or maybe for you, it's not my spouse or my boss's vision or my kid's vision. It's not even your vision. What is God's vision for your life? And think about this. Every major decision you make in life, you have the possibility of hitting close to 100% of God's vision or close to 0% of God's vision in that decision. What do I mean by that? I mean, in all these major decisions you're making, let's just take the, the huge one, salvation. If you make a choice for Jesus, man, you're, you're hitting 100% of what God is in your life. God wants you to find a relationship with him. If you're like, nah, that's, that's not for me, that's not my thing, then I believe you're hitting 0%. Well, now, what about your career? Because at, at, at any time, we're all going to be praying, God, what do you want me to do as a career? Now, some people say, there must be a perfect choice. Absolutely. I don't think there's a perfect choice. I think there's a variety of good choices, and I think you know at times in your life when you go and you click and you step in, you're like, God, I think this is what you designed me to do. I think you want me to be an optometrist, is that what optician. God, I think, for a minute, I think you called me to be an optician. It clicks, it fits, or maybe you've been at some points in your life, you're doing some job, and you're like, God, I hate this thing. This is awful. I hate the people I work with. I hate what I'm doing. I hate, and you're over here in the much lower percentage of God's vision for your life. God doesn't want you miserable. He wants you to find your spot. But you know what your spot is? Your, not, your spot is not defined by how much can I make? Your spot is defined by, like we talked about before the service, how can you impact for God's kingdom? How can I truly do what I'm designed to do the way I'm designed to do it? I want to find God's vision for that. Okay, how about relationships? Some people are like, you know, six billion people on the planet. How am I going to find the number one person, the only perfect one for me? I don't think there's a perfect one for you. I think God will give you a choice that there's a collection of, you know, ones that are very close, very high toward 100% of, you know, God's vision for your life. And some of you have found it. Man, when I see, you know, the, the newlyweds, they're eight months newlywed, they're right here, they're like, yes, I found her. I found him. And I'll see sometimes... You're in a dating relationship, and you're like, this ain't right. This, this is not the one God wants me with. And you either get all hard-headed and just keep going, and God says, okay, I'll let you. Or you, know, you move forward, and you're like, I'm going to wait. I'm going I'm to seek. I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to try to find, to find somebody that is within God's vision for my life, my relationships. How about with your money? You ever get in a spot where you're like, oh, my money is upside down. 
I cannot figure this out. I will never solve this. That, that's not God's vision for your life. Don't you say, Christians are supposed to be poor. They're supposed to struggle. That is not God's vision for your life. His vision is to come over here and say, God, I'm doing what you want me to do. I'm getting paid fairly or even better than fairly for it. And this is providing for me and my family so that I can bless my church, my community, my family, my world. I'm living out God's vision for my life in my finances. How about in terms of um, um, your health? Y'all, you know when sometimes you're drifting over here and you're like, oh, I'm so far away from God's vision from, from my life to the way alcohol's got a hold of me or drugs or overeating or laziness or whatever. And, and I'm not trying to guilt you. I'm trying to say there's hope that this isn't God's vision for your life. His vision is to come over here somewhere else. You're like, okay, I'm, I'm feeling better. I'm feeling stronger. I'm pushing back. The doctors are saying this, but I'm saying this. Like, Marquita, we're praying. Not surgery on that arthritis. We're praying healing on that arthritis. So you're moving into a spot where you're saying, God, I want to understand your vision for my life. And when I'm here in my health and my relationships and my finances and my career, this is a great place to be. It doesn't mean life's perfect. Jesus said you're going to have trouble. But over here, this is where you're clicking it's where, it's where, you know, Leah's finding her place in ministry. You know, church, ministry, that's part of your thing. Leah's stepping in recently like, God's vision for her life is pouring into little ones, little kids in our church. She is shining and glowing in that. And others of you, you might be like, oh, man, I hate serving this way, or I don't even want to serve. Like, I'm not even doing it. I'm getting, you know, like, you are so far away from God's best, what he wants for your life. So, to kind of wrap up, teach me something. You know, you know, what do you gain by living out his vision for your life? I thought through this critically. I think fulfillment is one word that I know in my life I'm constantly seeking. Like, God, I want to be fulfilled. I want to find the best you have for me so that I'm fulfilled, I'm at peace, I'm in abundance, I'm in victory. Who likes those words? Yo, I like those words. I like those words a whole lot. And when I'm over here, I'm not feeling very fulfilled, very abundant, very peaceful, very victorious. I want to live out God's vision for my life. So the last part of it then is how do you get better at living out God's vision for your life? Well, ultimately, number one, it all starts with having a relationship with God. And this isn't like a, hey, God, I know you're out there, and I'll pray over my meal, and I might even own a Bible. No, this is like I have a relationship. I'm getting to know God more, and he knows me. I have a relationship with God. It also means that you cultivate that relationship like you come into the body with other believers and you worship and you learn and you take it in and you serve, you cultivate it. You spend time in his word during the week. You spend time in prayer, which is talking to him and hearing from him. You cultivate that relationship. You surround yourself with Christian friends. You're gonna hear today about Bobby and Elsie, lead a couple small group. Meg will tell you about the end. You're like, man, I, I just need some people around me that'll help me in my walk. That's what you do. You get people around you to help you on that journey you be an active part of a church body. And then the last two things for being real is you learn from your mistakes. You learn from your mistakes so that you don't give up on hope. You don't, you don't blame yourself and feel bitter and mad. You're like, hey, I made some mistakes. I was here. But I'm learning from that. I'm moving this direction. That's where I'm going. And, and the last part of this, to live out God's vision for your life, is you got to have a heart like God's heart. you got to want to have a heart like God's heart. And when you do, I promise you, God's favor will shine on you more. You say, wow, I never knew about this job, this relationship, my finances, these pieces, to where you'll get in a spot where you'll be able to say, hey, I go to Vision Church because we lead people to Jesus Christ and we help them live out God's vision for your life. And someone will say, Jacoby, you living that out? They'll say, yeah, yes, I am. I'm not perfect, but I'm figuring this out. And I'm living out God's vision for my life. Okay, let me pray and I'm going to do some preaching. God, thank you for teaching us something today. Thank you, God, that you have a vision for my life. You have a vision for everyone who in here is watching, everybody who's watching online, everybody who's watching this message months from now, God, you have a vision for their life. And Jesus, you died for us so that we could live an abundant life, an eternal life. So God, help us to take this down deep inside of us to where we will live out your vision for our life. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. 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 Okay, so hey, Vision. Amen. All right. Um, I know we've lost some house lights. Can we go back to the, the light scene we just had, if we can get there? Because I need you to be able to see your Bibles, read your Bibles. 
Uh, does anybody need a takeaway card? If you didn't get a takeaway card, raise your hand, and um, John will bring those up to you. Elsie's got some here. Thank you, girl. Because with a takeaway card, you're going to have a chance to write down some things that I promise you will help you if you can remember them. You get to Monday, Tuesday, you're like, man, Pastor Matt says some good things. I just can't remember them. Jot down particularly the scriptures I give you today so that part of my role here in feeding you and teaching you how to feed yourself is that you take what I say today and then you go and spend time with the Lord this week. And you open up these scriptures and you go through them even slower. And you say, God, let me chew on this. Let me understand this. Because especially what we're talking about today is, um, honestly, it, it is one of the, I'd have to say top two, three, four chapters to me in the whole Bible. It's an amazing chapter. And uh, if you turn there right now to Acts chapter 2, if you don't have your Bible, we'll have a, some of these on the screen. You can get it on your phone. But Acts chapter 2, which comes after you know, all the Gospels have been written and finished and, and Jesus finished his journey. And then Acts chapter 1, we talked about last week, you know, he, he ascended to heaven and he told the guys, he said, wait, there's something coming. There's someone coming. And it's a gift. Now, okay, let's be real for a minute here. Who, who in here likes getting gifts? Who likes gifts? I haven't thought about this out today. You know, I might bring like some 20s in here or something. Say, who wants some gifts? Who wants some 20s? Y'all be knocking each over and getting up here. I got to get that. I got to buy some lunch. Okay, no 20s. But I do want to show you some gifts. I did a little search this week. Said, so, okay, on Amazon, some of the most popular gifts for women. You know, summer's coming. It's going to be hot. Surely you ladies are going to want something like this. Shh, like shoots like cool air and water up on it, cools you down, whatever. Or maybe like you've had a long week, you're like, oh, I'm so sore. And my, you know, my husband or boyfriend like, won't give me a back rub. So you get like one of these next ones here as a gift. You're like, oh, who wants one of those? <laughs> who wants somebody to run one of those for you? Absolutely. I like that. And then um, let's see. What was, what was our? Th oh, this third one is because for some of y'all, life is just kind of chaos. And you're like, yeah. Who needs that mug on their desk at home or at work? Yes, Carolyn, I see that hand. She's like, Lord, help. Now, also, y'all, here in Gaston County, I knew this had to be one of the most popular gifts around because uh, <laughs> you know that, ladies. Yeah. Any ladies in the room carrying a knife right now? Oh, I've seen hands go up. I like it. I like it. And I said, well, how about the men, though? What do men want? Men pretty much want, like, like one thing. There we go. They, they want a recliner. They want a recliner. But uh, in, in all seriousness, today, this, uh, this title I've given it is The Gift Arrives. The Gift Arrives. And that gets me excited because, you know, man, if you, if you order something on Amazon or through some of those companies where it comes, like, on the boat, it takes, like, you know, months to get there, and you're waiting for that gift to arrive, and then you get the little notification, like, you're, you're at work or something, say, doo -doo. the gift has arrived at your house. You're like, yes, the gift has arrived. So this gift that Jesus talked about is an amazing gift. And this gift is a person. We learn about this person today, the Holy Spirit, who arrived in Acts chapter 2. Now, when he arrived, and uh, God taught me some cool things on this this week. Um, he arrives at, uh, it's called Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. Everybody say Pentecost. Pentecost. Okay, was anybody when you are younger ever afraid of the word Pentecost? Pentecost, Pentecostal, Pentecostals, and you're like, hey, that, that's just, that's just got to be weird, crazy, right? Anything I've ever heard, known, whatever, that's, and like people run around and crazy. No, no, no. The word Pentecost is not a scary word at all. Pentecost simply means 50. It's, it's a Greek word. Pene is five, and cost is to the 10th, so Pentecost. And when you think about what's happening in Acts chapter 2, there are, some, there are really some neat parallels to the Old Testament. And this is where you can even, you know, jot down some things and, and, and look them up yourself if you want. But Pentecost, the original uh, Pentecost, uh, comes after the original Passover. If you remember the Israelites, they were in uh, captivity to the Egyptians. And what God says was, if you trust me, paint blood on your doorposts so the death angel will pass over. Everybody say Passover. Passover. Okay, that's what happened that night when the death angel passed over and the firstborn boys were spared. So that happened um, in, uh, in, in Egypt. Then the Israelites you know, got out of there. And 50 days later, Moses was up on Mount Sinai 
when God gave him the law. Literally, he, he sent him the Ten Commandments on tablets. You remember that? If you're even new to church, haven't been here in a while, you probably know Moses got the Ten Commandments, came down the mountain, came down the mountain. That was, that was 50 days after the Passover, so Pentecost, 50 days. He came down, and it's so interesting. When you look into this in the book of Exodus, that very soon after he came down and went to the people, and they had gone like stupid crazy. You think it's just modern-day generate? There's always been people stupid crazy, okay? <laughs> so people are down there taking gold, melting it, and they're like, it just became a calf. And we started worshiping it. You're like, gold doesn't just become a cow, okay? It doesn't, that doesn't just happen. But they're down there doing all this, and, uh, and basically God says, Moses, get the, uh, the ones who are faithful to me. They were the, the Levites. He said, get them, go into the camp, and just start whooping up on people. And the Bible records in Exodus that 3,000 people died. You're like, now wait a second. Okay, so there was the Passover, and then 50 days later, there was something powerful hearing from God, and then shortly after that, 3,000 people were affected. Does that sound like anything? It sounds like something to me, because when you look at Acts chapter 2, this is happening now in Pentecost, which is 50 days after the Passover when Jesus died, 50 days later, something amazing happens, and at the end of this chapter, 3,000 people get saved. How about that? God doesn't, he doesn't work in happenstances. He does things. He shows it from thousands of years ago, and he makes it better now. So we're going to, um, to Acts chapter 2. And what I'm going to do is my original plan was to read through all of Acts chapter 2 and break out pieces, but honestly, I got about halfway, two-thirds through, and God was like, Matt, that's enough for this week. Don't rush through it. Spend time in this. And my like, God, where do I stop? He said, I'll just tell you when to stop. So I'm listening for him to tell me when to stop. I'm not sure it'll be 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock, 2 o'clock. I'm just kidding. It, it, won't, it won't be that long. But as we go through Acts chapter 2, take a look at it with me, and then you spend more time in it this week with the Lord because this is rich, rich history of the church. Acts chapter 2, verse 1 says, when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting. And we read that like, wow, that must have been interesting. Y'all, that would be straight out crazy. You imagine if we're sitting in here and it is so loud that literally y'all are like, uh, who, who's ever been around a tornado before? I, I have not. Okay, but tornado, we got tornado picture. So if it's like whoosh, so loud in here, everybody's like checking their phones like, is there like some, you know, amber alert about tornadoes or something? Like, is there something coming down New Hope Road? We're like, no, that's just a sound. You know, okay, who was here with Hurricane Hugo? I, had, I was just close to moving down here. I was, what, 89, I think, when Hugo uh, came. You're sitting in here, and let's say Hugo is going on outside of us. Crazy loud sounds. And you're like, oh, that's interesting. No, you're not. You're like, this is really scary. This should not be happening. That's what happened in this room with 120 people in it, that there was a sound, like, so violent. In fact, uh, me and Meg can remember back... When we lived over in Belmont and we had our, our, our boys were young and Elena hadn't been born yet and there was this ice storm that was so loud and crazy and uh, scary that a tree was like cracking and stuff and, and I feared for my, my family's life. I remember running up the stairs to snatch our boys as quick as we could and get out to the minivan and get out and we get out there and it's like heart is pounding. Like God, what is going on? You imagine being in a room where there's that type of intensity because of the sound. God wanted that to be a memorable day. This was not just like another day, another day, another thing. This was a memorable day. Go to Acts 2 verse 3. It said, so they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All right, y'all, that starts happening here. Everybody is, is busting out their iPhones saying, okay, I'm shooting this, putting this live right now. Like, Maya has got fire. Maya's like, uh, well, actually, you also have fire. Like, what, there's fire over my head? And it was an interesting faith moment because, you know, nobody could see their own fire. They're like, I can't, I can't see on top of my own head. You're like, no, but you, you got one, Kevin. You got one there falling. Like, you got one falling. Have I got one? Like, you got one. And they're like, what is going on? The sound and, like, fire Above our heads, what is happening? Well, verse 4, it says, All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak 
in other tongues as the Spirit enabled them. And that word tongues also could be interpreted languages. So what was happening in that moment, this is again like a, like a, like a reflection from the Old Testament. Who remembers the Tower of Babel? Remember that, that kind of that story, Tower of Babel? Tower of Babel, what happened is all these people are getting together and they're like, we're going to try to reach God. In fact, let's, let's just try to be God, okay? Let's like build something up so we can reach God and, and be God's ourselves. And they start building something up. And what God does, he confuses them all. Boom, they're all speaking different languages. He just like tosses his hand there and said, That's, you can't do that, not going to happen. What I'm saying is in the, the reflection of it is in this moment, when people aren't saying, we're trying to reach God, be God, they're saying, God, we're just trying to seek you. We want the gift, God. Jesus promised us a gift. We want that gift. They've been praying constantly together in prayer together. They're like, God, we want that gift. God says, okay, I'm like the Tower of Babel where I just like confused everybody. He said, actually, in this moment, I'm going to unify everybody. He said, now, people walking in. Let's just imagine it's modern day, somebody's speaking in Spanish, somebody's speaking in Vietnamese, somebody there's speaking in German. But the people walk in there like, wait a second, I speak German. I, I can understand what they're saying. I can understand the Spanish. I can understand the Vietnamese. And a consistent message is being heard by everybody. God's saying, I have something to tell you. And you're in the right place to hear it. So on your uh, takeaway card, I have five questions that I want you to think about this week. And these are kind of questions where you like think about them briefly right here, but it's where you go into your prayer closet, back porch, truck, wherever you go to spend time with God, and you spend time on these questions. Because the first question is, do you want the power of God in your life? And you're like, of course, pastor. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm watching sermon online. I, of course I do. No, I, I want you to sit back and think, like, do I really want the power of God in my life? Because sometimes the power of God is going to be like a rushing wind or sometimes like a tongue of fire or sometimes like people speaking different languages. Do you want the power of God in your life? And if it's a yes, and I'm not asking you to hurry it or even answer it now, but if it's a yes, then my second question to you is why? You know, why do you want the power of God in your life? Because you can say a lot of different things. Matt, this world is crazy. It's out of control. I can't, I can't trust anything. I can't even trust myself anymore. I need to trust something or someone bigger than me. Well, well some of the examples, I guess, of the answer that, that I came up with, and you need to come up with your answer, is, you know, I, I want peace that is beyond the peace that, that I can manufacture. I want wisdom so that when I'm faced with all these different questions of life, I'm like, God, I, I need your power for this. For me, it's courage. You know, God, I, I want courage. Hey, I can, I can man up like the best of them, but God, when it really is leaning down on me and I'm by myself and I'm thinking about it, do I really have courage? God, I want your power in me so I can have courage. I, I had two more that I came up with. I, I want self-control because I know so many times in my life, you talk about the God's vision for your life, I'd land over here when I didn't have self-control. I'm like, man, why'd I say that? Man, why'd I do that? Man, why'd I, why'd I punch a hole in a wall? God, why, why don't I have more self-control? God says, you need more of my power in your life, self-control. And then my last one for me, at least, was patience. And I'm like, God, if, if I can have your power, your patience, I think I can live this life a little bit differently. So back to you. I'm asking you sometime this week that you spend time with this and you literally say, God, do I want your power in my life? And you be real with him. And if it's yes... And you take some time to think about the why and make sure it's the right why. It's, I want the power. I want the control. I want all these things. No, 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 no. God, God doesn't, he doesn't answer that. But you figure out for you what it looks like of why you want his power in your life. Okay, so back to these guys in early church. Because evidently all of them, best I can tell, they wanted the power of God in their life because they all were filled with the Holy Spirit. It doesn't say 118 of them were filled and two of them, they were just there to check it out today and they left. No, 120 people-ish were there that day because they wanted the power of God in their life. They opened up to it and instantly they were filled with his power. Now there's um, you know, various evidences of the Holy Spirit and we'll continue to unpack this throughout the book of Acts, whether it's gifts of the Spirit, fruit of the Spirit, 
all kind of manifestations of the Spirit, but I want, I want you to understand this, and I'll, I'll, at the end of my message, I'll nail this down again. We are not chasing the gifts. We're chasing the giver of the gifts. So don't miss this, because like in our relationship, me and Nelson, if all he wants from me is gifts, man, I don't want that kind of friendship. I want that Nelson wants me because I'm the, I'm the giver of gifts. And sometimes the gift is a hug. The gift is love. The gift is friendship. That's what our relationship is built on. It's not, hey, Pastor Matt, could you just give me $20? Hey, Pastor Matt, can you just do something for me? That's pursuing the gifts. We're pursuing the giver of the gifts, and gifts will follow. Okay? So make sure you get that. Make sure you get that. We're continuing on, verse 5 and 6. Now, they were staying in Jerusalem, God-fearing Jews from every nation under heaven, when they heard this sound. And again, this sound again was the wind, fire, tongues, languages. They heard this sound. A crowd came together. You bet you they did, man. You talk about drawing a crowd. They're coming in for that. Came together in bewilderment because each one heard their own language being spoken. Now, I spoke a little bit last week about some of these words of bewilderment or perplexed. Let me just unpack this again. Bewilderment usually means like confusion. So it's saying the crowd came together in confusion. If we're being real, I would be confused too if I walked in on a room where there was big old wind, lots of fire going on, all kind of different languages being spoken by people who didn't know the languages. I would be confused as well. But um, in terms of bewilderment, it also means a feeling of being perplexed and confused. And I talked about last week that perplexed means confused and slightly worried by something because you don't understand it. And that's different than being confused and scared. That's worse than being, you know, just you know, amazed at what's going on. I got to run. Like, I'm, I'm confused, but I want to understand it. That, to me, shows a teachability where you're like, God, I, I want to know what's going on. I want to understand this. So uh, we continue in verses uh, 7 and 8, 11 and 12. It says, utterly amazed, they asked, aren't all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it each of us hears them in our own native language? We jump down to verse 11. We hear them declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. Amazed and perplexed, they asked one another, what does this mean? So again, I think they're saying, okay, I don't understand this, but I, I want to understand it. I want to understand, what's this with the wonders of God? What is happening in this place today? Well, you know, in verse 11, when it talks about declaring the wonders of God, when it says they're perplexed, I feel like they progress from just being confused to wanting to understand it, to, to being amazed. So this is kind of where I also feel like God's tracking us parallel about this whole teach me something. If you come into Vision Church on Sundays, you're like, I want to understand something. Like, God, I want to know more about this journey. I want to know more about you. Would you teach me? I promise you God will say yes. He will always teach you if you're willing. So these people that day, they're like, God, I want to know more about you. So this takes me to question number three I would ask you then. This is on your takeaway card again. What emotions do you feel when you think about the Holy Spirit working or when you see the Holy Spirit working? What emotions do you feel? And this is, again, where you need to spend some time with God this week and be real. And you're like, God, I, I, I feel confused. When I, when I hear the Holy Spirit working, when I, when I sense him moving in a room and I don't know why people are so excited, when I, I hear about somebody being healed or I hear about somebody blessed or I hear somebody speaking in tongues or praying in tongues, God, it, it confuses me and I just want to bail out. And if that's you, I want to say just be careful with that because God doesn't want you to bail out. God wants you to be that more that, that perplexed where you're confused but wanting to understand don't bail out. Maybe the emotion is um, the one that Meg talks about often is how interesting. Y'all ever heard me say that before? How interesting. When something happens to you that someone may say, ooh, that's bad. And don't just jump to bad. Pause and say, how interesting. God, what are you doing in this moment? And it's not always easy. And I'm not trying to make light of your heavy situation when the doctor gives you a report, when the extra bill comes in. When your boss says we're laying people off, when somebody breaks up with you and say, this is awful, it's terrible, would you just have the self-control to pause for a moment and say, okay, God, how interesting. What are you teaching me right now? What do you want me to learn right now? So again, this question number three of how, 
how do you feel when you hear of the Holy Spirit working or you see him working? If you would pause and say, okay, God, this is interesting. Would, would, you, would you teach me more? So um, this other phrase about, about what does this mean, we saw that in, uh, in verse 12. What does this mean? What does this mean for you? Because it's no accident you're hearing this message. There's no accident. God is speaking to you today, and he wants you to be in that posture, saying, God, what does this mean? What, what do you have for me in this? And then, but in, in verse 13, we see the contrary. Some, however, made fun of them and said, they've been drinking too much. They've sloshed, man. they drunk. And it's so funny because Peter then, if it was me, I'd be like, they're not drinking. These are holy people. He said, they're not drinking. It's only 9 in the morning. I'm like... Well, what if it was a two o'clock service? I don't know. It's like, okay. But instead of saying how interesting, they're like, these people are just flat out crazy. This is just wrong. Don't, don't jump to that. That's the bailing out. Don't, don't bail out and go there because in verse 13, when some were making fun of them, and understand, there were thousands of people now in this area. Thousands. How do I know that? Because while some of them were making fun of them, you jump ahead 28 verses to verse 41, 3,000 of them got saved. 3,000 people came into a relationship with God that day. Then it says in verse 47, daily they saw people saved. Here's what I'm saying. Some people will choose to say, I'm going to make fun of that. I'm not believing that. Thousands of others will say, there's something in that. There's eternity in that. There's power in that. Don't you be with the people that land right here because this is not God's vision for their life at all to say, man, they just drunk, stupid. This is annoying. This is weird. I remember that I always had bad feelings about the Holy Spirit. This is where I land. No, 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 no. How interesting. Oh, I want to learn. I want to know. Maybe you'll step into being one of the 3,000 or one of the daily who are being saved. That's what happens when you let God's power infiltrate you. That's what can happen. Because in verse 14 of this chapter, you see, um, and, and again, you spend time this week digging into what Peter says these next couple minutes because it's a different Peter. This is a Peter who just a couple chapters ago would not stand up in his faith to a teenage girl. No offense to teenage girls. No offense at all. But you bet, like say little Maya here, so sweet, up here singing. And if Nelson's like, I can't even tell her about my faith. Nelson, that's pitiful, man. You're a strong man, confident man. Tell her about your faith. Peter, a couple of chapters before, I can't even tell her. I'm scared. What will happen? Now in verse 14, you see him standing up in front of thousands professing his faith in Christ. And it's not a soft, seeker-sensitive message. And I'm all about being seeker-sensitive because I want seekers to feel like we're thinking about people who are seeking God. But he literally stands up and said, you're the ones who killed him. You're the ones who stood for him being killed. How can you do this? And instead of people getting all mad, thousands came to Christ. That's the new Peter because he had received the gift. A couple more things. Verses 17 and 18. Check this out. I, I love this. Chapter 2, verse 17 and 18 says, in the last days, God says, I will pour out my spirit on all people. Your sons and daughters will prophesy. Your young men will see visions. Your old men will dream dreams. I'm claiming that I'm still seeing visions, okay? I'm not crossing that line into old men. I'm on the side of seeing visions, okay? That's where I'm at. 51 and feeling good and getting stronger and younger. That's why I run with this young crowd over here. That's why I do that. But in all seriousness, this concept of God pouring out his spirit, what an interesting concept. So I took some time this week to really think about that. Like, God, what, what does that mean when you think about somebody's, somebody's spirit? Because you know when someone walks in a room or you hear somebody speak or you watch them on TV and you're like, wow, there's something about that person. I want some more of what they have. So here are some of the somebodies I thought of. I thought of Martin Luther King Jr. I thought, that man, if I could just have, when he lived, if he could just like pour some of that on me, like his conviction, his beliefs, his faith in God. How about Billy Graham? This guy... He was not fancy. He preached God's word, and then he just followed God obediently. That's what he did. He said, God, I'm going to preach it. Whatever you do with it, I'm like, man, I, I need some more of that in my life. How about even a, a less spiritual side, modern day, uh, Caitlin Clark. Who's heard of Caitlin Clark? I know you have, Brian. 
This young lady, she is changing basketball. Like literally, people now are saying, wow, the way she loves basketball, the way she, she works hard and does things the right way and excels and, and, does, and people look at her like, wow, I can believe in sports again. I can follow sports. I can do that. Now, how about even uh, personally on our team here? I think of um, my son, our son, Emmaus. He wasn't here today, but usually he's right here playing the keys. Okay, <laughs> hold that up there for a minute. If you hadn't met Emmaus, his spirit almost like goes before him. His energy, his passion. Now, I'm not saying we all have to be you know, loud and all this. You don't have to be that, but you do need zest for life. And I thought, well, God, if, if you're talking about pouring out your spirit, what if just like with Emmaus, just like he could like pour out a little bit of his spirit, like that, that zest for life. And I was like, you know, I was saying about pictures of him, and uh, we had this, this, this other one, which I just had to toss in just because it's, it's funny. So uh, that says years ago. <laughs> but even younger, I had this zest for life. But, but I want you to get this. When you think about pouring out his spirit, I think about this next picture. Because this next picture is also our son. That one Sunday before he preached, before anybody else was here besides the band, he, he's over there down on his knees talking to God about what God wanted to say to you that Sunday. So here's my point. We look at people, and maybe something inside of us says, man, I, I wish they would kind of pour out some of their spirit on me. God is saying the same thing. He's like, I got my spirit to pour out on you. If you want him, he's available. So my fourth question then is, how do you respond to God's offer to pour out my spirit into your life? How do you respond to that? Do you, do you resist, completely run? You're like, how much longer is this going to go? It's like, I can't get, wait to get to lunch. And if that's where you're at in your journey, then I appreciate you being here. Just keep listening. Because if you're here and you're like, I don't want any of this power, I don't want it. God says, that's, that's not my vision for your life. What if you're like a wait and see? You're like, okay, I'm going to wait and see. It's so cool about Jesus. He said, great, I want you to wait and see. Now, there's risk because you die without relationship with God, you're going to hell. But God is not going to rush you, hurry you, say, in this moment, I'm going to make you do something. If you're like, I'm going to wait and see, God says, okay, wait and see. Or maybe you're ready to be filled. You're like, yes, God, I, 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 want, I want this gift. I want... This power. And uh, Tommy, I guess you guys can come on up because I'm, I'm just about done. Let's go down to verse 19. It says, I'll show wonders in the heavens above and signs on the earth below, blood and fire and billows of smoke. The sun will be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the coming of the great and glorious day of the Lord. And everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. It's really a simple message. You can say, oh, that wind, all that fire, and, and speak it in foreign languages. What's happening? Jesus quietly says, everyone who calls on me will be saved. And then we can work on gift, the Holy Spirit. Then we can work on the gifts. Then we can work on your calling. He said, but it starts right there, that everyone who calls on me will be saved. And like I mentioned earlier, it's not about seeking the, the manifestation of the Spirit. That, that will come. It's about seeking the Spirit. It's about a relationship with God. And in that relationship, then, you'll, you'll see the Holy Spirit work. He'll do things in and through you. That, honestly, it'll go way beyond, beyond my life. It'll go way beyond some of these, these people who were there that day. Like you, God wants to shine through you. He does. And so to, uh, to finish here, down in verse 25 through 28, Said so David said about him, I saw the Lord always before me. Because he is at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore, my heart is glad, my tongue rejoices. My body also will rest in hope, because you will not abandon me to the realm of the dead. You will not let your holy one see decay. You've made me you've made known to me the paths of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. You think about landing in God's vision for your life, he will fill you with joy. If, if you missed the message back in December, I talked about joy, and I said, you know, our world says it's like, there's like gloom and okay and average and better and good and awesome and joy. That, that's, that's not it. 
Joy is not a progression beyond all these other bad or good things. Joy is like a whole other chart where you can be in the doctor's office and he says, I'm, I'm, I'm seeing cancer. And you're like, I still have joy. You could be doing your finances. It's, it's, it's just the numbers aren't working. You say, but, but I, I still have joy. How, how do you have that? Because I'm in his presence. Amen. The word says, you're going to fill me with joy in your presence. And this, this gift that God sent is such a great gift because even when Jesus was here on earth, nobody was with him every minute of the day. But the Holy Spirit, he could be with you every minute of the day. And so my, my fifth and final question for you, you see on the card there, is are you seeking the gifts or are you seeking the giver? And I want you to take these questions home with you this week and look back and like, okay, God, what do you really want to do in my life with this gift of the Holy Spirit, this opportunity for power? Because, God, I want to be living right here. I want to be right here in your vision for my life. I want to have joy in your presence that I can, like the word said, that I will not be shaken. I won't be moved. And so, um, so as we finish then, and Michael, let me just pass these to you, if I could. Thank you. He says, I pray for you here in a second. just want to ask you, what, what's the Holy Spirit telling you today? Imagine that. Six billion people on this planet, and he wants to tell you something right now. That's fine. We'll give him it. Thank you. The Holy Spirit, literally, he wants you to take away something personal from today. He doesn't want you to bail out, scared. He doesn't even really want you to wait and see. Like he, he wants you to move forward on whatever your next steps are, whether it's salvation, whether it's being baptized at our church, baptized in the Holy Spirit, moving forward in gifts, being prayed for for something in your life, all these different pieces. In fact, I'll ask our care team, any of our members of the care team, if you guys would come forward now, stand here at the front if you're part of our care team, and also if I just entrust people like Bobby and Elsa, I love you guys, come forward too, uh, come pray, uh, care and follow, will you guys come here too? That, in fact, Zach, we already talked about this week, man. You, you come up here too, man. So if we got young adults who need somebody to pray, like, y'all just come forward here and, and, and take spots up here. Because in terms of what the Holy Spirit's telling you, when, uh, when I step down in a minute and I'll, uh, I'll leave it to our team just to kind of play softly for a minute or two or three, and then we'll, we'll sing a song together. But as, as the Holy Spirit's speaking to you, working in you, if you want to come forward and, and pray with anybody up here, we're just here to serve you. There's no superheroes up here, but there are people that are, that are filled with this gift. <laughs> That's what God does. So if you guys would close your eyes a minute. Actually, if everybody stand up, everybody stand up. And then as you stand, then close your eyes. And God, I want to thank you for Acts chapter 2. God, this, this amazing day in history when the gift arrived. When he arrived, your Holy Spirit And so, Spirit, I'm asking you to speak to each person in the room or watch it online or whatever you want for each of us to hear. Will you ever be teaching each of us? In fact, if that teaching right now is that someone's supposed to re receive Christ for the first time, you can pray in your heart right now something like this. God, I need you. I need you. I'm a sinner. I have made mistakes, and I've been far from you. But today I want to have a relationship with you. I believe what Pastor Matt is saying about Jesus, the Savior of the world. I'm giving my life to him. I want to live for him in this life and for eternity. And if you prayed that with sincerity in your heart, I promise you God hears you and your story changed. Like, like Mary Magdalene, you, you've been redeemed. Thank you, God. You're, you're still in the redemption business. So we worship you, Jesus. We thank you for the gift. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So um, I'll just entrust it to you guys whenever you feel like starting a song, but just kind of just keep it you know, quiet for a minute, two, three. But if you, if you need prayer for something, come on forward and just pick whoever you want. It doesn't matter if you don't know them. If they don't know you, just come on up here. It'll be private. Just kind of you know, whisper them, hey, here's what I need. Do you pray for me with this? Do you help me with this? And just come on forward. Hang out with our team. Let's pray together. And then we'll sing. We hope that you enjoyed this week's message. If you just made a decision to accept Jesus, then congratulations. We would love to celebrate with you. Visit viz.church/salvation, and we look forward to meeting you along with mailing you a free gift. 
We would love to have you join us for church in person or on the Vision Network this Sunday at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. Head on over to viz.church slash RSVP to let us know you're coming. As always, we are here for you and please contact our team if we can pray for you in any way. Thanks again for joining us and God bless.